know to what extent you exaggerated what I did, but um, I'll find out uh, later today. But thanks a lot for the, uh, for the introduction. Um, when thinking about what to uh, present here, I thought, well, I could opt for a traditional academic conference talk about one of my latest projects. Uh, that's what we often do at these um, occasions. But I thought it would be nicer for me, and certainly, hopefully, for you, uh, that I approach it a bit differently, and that I thought that's one of the themes that has been fascinating me for a long time is, is, is why people vote as they do. If Why do people support Trump or Clinton, or why do people support certain parties in Portugal or in the Netherlands or in Japan or wherever? Um, and I've been trained as a political scientist, um, primarily at Leiden University in the Netherlands, um, and I got an image there of why people vote as they do. And I try, I've adjusted that image across the years, and I've, I thought that basically I was wrong when I was younger. Perhaps I'm still wrong, but I was even wronger when I was younger. And I thought not only me, not only I was wrong, but I think I was in excellent company of some great people who also had an idea about why people vote as they do and what's going on in people's minds. Um, but my conclusion was that political scientists and electoral researchers, they think they know how the people's mind works, but psychology has told us that they are basically wrong, that they have wrong ideas about why actually people behave the way they do. And I thought that's a theme that's been in my PhD dissertation and I've been in the back of my mind and I thought I'd, 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 I'd like to use the opportunity to share these ideas um, with you. So that's the, the title, How Political Scientists Think the Voter's Mind Works and Why They Are Wrong. And political scientist includes me for a long time. Um, there are two questions that I will be dealing with then. The first one is what's really psychological about all these mainstream political science theories about why people feed, vote as they do. Um, are they really psychological? And the second part is what is uh, the image, what are the assumptions that scholars make about the psychology of voting? So these are the two elements that I will, will touch upon. And it's also a bit of an overview of a history of electoral research for more than half a century, because I was expecting not everybody here to be too familiar with the, the field. It's, it's also about leadership, but I'm focusing on why people elect and select certain, certain leaders. For a long time, there's been a distinction in electoral research about three different approaches you can take to study why people vote as they do. And, and this strongly has been influenced by American research, like much of the research in academia has, been, has a strong American influence that certainly applies to, to this subfield. Um, a sociological approach. The typical image of is, is especially from the 1950s in, in the Netherlands, but also in the, in the rest of Europe, as well as in the States. If you know what gr social group people belong to, if you know their religion, if you know their race, if you know their social class, you can basically predict how they will be voting. Uh, perhaps there are some differences between countries in terms of what social characteristics differ, but if you know these type of things, you can predict what people do. And the psychology is basically a black box. If in the 50s in the Netherlands you were a Catholic and you went to church at least once a month, you would always vote for the Catholic party. You didn't really need psychology to understand. It was, it was the social surrounding that could give an accurate prediction. Um, Lazarus Feld is the key author um, in, in the American literature. Uh, a psychological approach is associated with people from the Michigan uh, University, Angus Campbell and his colleagues with famous works like The Voter Decides and The American Voter, and they put really the emphasis on if we want to understand what people do at the polling booth, we need to go into their minds, we need to map that. And they put the emphasis on party identification, partisanship, people have a strong identification with either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, um, and that influences the attitudes they have and that influences the voting behavior. And I think actually this approach still helps us a lot with understanding what's been going on with Trump versus Clinton. I think that's, I was surprised about all the people who were surprised that Trump won. Uh, because if you look at the American literature from the 1950s onwards, uh, they have been saying in the United States, um, Americans identify either with the Democratic Party or with the Republican Party. And especially in the last years, the last, say, 10 years or more, it's been quite polarized. There's few people who really shift camps, so to say. Uh, if you look at the patterns, uh, you could easily see that now again, 90% of the Democrats supported their candidate, Clinton. 90% of the Republicans supported their candidate, Donald Trump. I think this is something that certainly in the Dutch public debate, people completely forget. They only look at the individuals and think they can't understand why someone would vote for either of them. I think the sentiment with respect to Trump is a bit stronger that people don't understand 
why they vote for them in the Netherlands and certainly in academia. But I think they easily forget about the party attachments. Um, and, and if you look at the patterns, in that sense, it was a very, very normal election. Um, an incumbent who had been in office for two terms usually gets kicked out afterwards and then it shifts to the other party. Uh, the economy wasn't flourishing that much that you would say, well, that will save the Democrats. So the fixed patterns are really there. And I think the psychological approach and focusing on party identification certainly helps for understanding the American case. I think in Europe it's really different with multi-party systems, the attachments being, being, being weaker. The third approach is the economic approach, um, strongly influenced by the work of Anthony Downs uh, in economic theory of voting, who really put the emphasis on policy preferences. VO key with a responsible electorate is another classic work fitting that idea that people really are rational, that they focus on the policies they get, that they make an inventory of what the policy packages are that the candidates and the parties have on offer, and that they calculate what's the best match between them and the policy packages that the parties or the candidates offer. So these are roughly the three approaches that are distinguished. Um, but I would say they all look at the same thing with different glasses on. Um, they study the same phenomena, um, and they are often portrayed as really contrary, but I think it's, it's a misunderstanding. I think they're not that much contrary. They look at the same thing, they see things a bit differently, but it's not as different as we tend to think. And there's a cartoon that I think nicely reflects that, um, that they both claim to be right. Uh, one says three, the other says four, it would say, well, one must be right, right? And the other must be wrong. Uh, but perhaps they're both right. Uh, and the same with the economic, the sociological, and the psychological approach. It's not that it's either or. They both add, or they all three add something to our understanding of the way people behave. Um, so what's really psychological or not psychological about it? Because if you say there's sociological, econo economic, and psychological perspectives, it's, it suggests that there are two non-psychological ways of looking at voting and a psychological way. And I think that's also a misunderstanding. Paul Lazarsfeld and, and the People's Choice and the follow-up study by Berylson on voting um, is much more psychological than people realize. If you read these books, and I think I really recommend people to, to look at the classics. They are so rich, they're so well written, they so much help with understanding everything. They really put the emphasis on what's on in people's mind. And I've selected a few quotations, and if you're interested in getting the presentation, just drop me an email, and I'm happy to, to share it. I would appreciate if you sent me the email in English, because I'm really sorry that I don't speak Portuguese. Um, so, so if I now receive an email in Portuguese, I might use Google Translate and try to figure it out. But if you would be so kind and do it in English, I would really uh, appreciate that. They speak, for instance, about cross pressures and about the fact that people might l like one candidate for one reason and another candidate for another reason. These are all elements of the way of looking at voting that really tap into the psychological processes. It's not only about social characteristics. That's the, the, the image we nowadays have, certainly if you look at some of the secondary literature. But they focus on psychological processes. And there's another quotation. from the follow-up study the same scholars did that, that makes it clear. They say that what parties do affect what voters think they are and what the voters think they are affects what they subsequently do. The parties have their main impact in the attitudes and the perceptions held by the voters. Accordingly, the next step is to review what Republicans and Democrats think about politics, the pictures in their heads. I think if I would put this in an exam in an electoral behavior course, I would say for who wrote these words, they would all say it's from the American voter or the voter decides. People are not aware that this mixture between sociology and psychology is not as strongly made in these books. To a certain extent, you can say the same thing about the economic approaches by Anthony Downs. Basically, Anthony Downs says if we want to understand why people vote a certain way, we, have to, we can use the analogy of his political space. Parties or candidates have certain policies that they propose and that can be, uh, and, and, and individuals, voters have a preference for certain policies, and